Governor, thank you for the time. We always appreciate you uh, hosting sure. us. Let me ask you about something that I've heard a lot since the end of the trial. Mm -hmm. People are telling me that they think Ken Paxton is now the most feared politician in the state. Do you think that's so? I haven't heard it. Uh, I don't know, haven't even thought about it, to be honest with you. The House and the Senate obviously have two very different beliefs about Ken Paxton and the impeachment. We've had a few days, though, since the end of mm -hmm. this. How do you think history is going to judge it? One of the reasons I made my remarks after the verdict was in was I wanted to be sure that when history, when those in the future look back at what we did in the Senate and the House, that they had a full picture of what happened. Uh, I believe in the Senate, we conducted a fair trial. Uh, I know that our members spent several months uh, during the summer um, looking at whatever they could find to prepare themselves. You know, as judge and presiding officer, I issued 240 subpoenas. There were motions that, that were filed and answers to motions that were filed and orders I had to make. And I probably read over a thousand pages of history and documents and various things to prepare. So I want history to know that the Texas Senate did it right and the Texas House did it wrong. And I don't mean to criticize individuals there. I'm talking about the process. This was not as, as um, John Smithy said on the floor. Uh, he said this is not about guilt or innocence, it's about the process. The House didn't go back and look at what the House did in 1917. They didn't look back in the 1800s. If they did, they totally ignored what they did. So the reason I made my statements when I did is 50 or 100 years from now, when the next impeachment happens, they're not going to go back and pull up this interview or something in the newspaper. They're going to look at the record. And so that's what I put my comments on the record. And I think they'll say the Senate did their job. We spent 90 days uh, preparation. We spent nine days in court, about 50 to 60 hours of testimony. They spent about nine hours uh, studying the evidence in what was called deliberations, compared to the House spent four hours on the floor. That should never happen again. The House, in any future impeachment, should do what they did in 1917, put people under oath, allow cross-examination, give the defendant a chance to answer questions, and give the members weeks to study it. If they had done what they did in 1917, I don't think they would have sent us anything because they would have discovered the evidence was not there beyond a reasonable doubt. You want to change the state constitution to, to make yes. these changes in, in black and white in yes. law. Do you think there are, are votes in the House to do that? And, and secondly, how soon could something like that happen? Would, would that be in a special session or is that next legislative session? We can do session? it in the next session. I, I want to put together an interim study on it. But here are the, the key things. Uh, in the federal impeachment process, Bill Clinton and Donald Trump didn't have to step down from the Oval Office while they were impeached. But in Texas, you have to um, be released, suspended in essence, without pay. Right. Uh, and the House currently, the way they did it, everything was built on hearsay, double hearsay, and triple hearsay. Everything that they said. Well, you can't impeach people, you shouldn't impeach people to remove them from office for a long period of time without pay based on hearsay. And so what we need to change in the Constitution, right now it says the House may put people under oath. Well, this House decided not to. The other statewide impeachments put people under oath. This speaker decided not to put anyone under oath or the investigation committee. But technically they were following the law then, as it's written Yeah, down. it says may. But they should have done the right thing. You put people under oath, otherwise people can say anything. And they did, obviously, because they were all destroyed on cross-examination as witnesses. So I want to change the Constitution. The House must. You can't impeach someone on hearsay and double hearsay. Number two, there should be an amount of time, you know, they rushed this through. The last week of session when we're super busy, over Memorial Day weekend when no one was, when was watching, uh, the House should have the members at least two weeks to look at the evidence before voting on impeachment. They never had that opportunity. And we should not make someone step down without pay while the impeachment process is going on. So we need to change those three things. And if the House doesn't go along, hopefully we can pass it out of the Senate. I think we will. I haven't talked to anybody about it, but I think it makes sense. The House should do it. It's the right thing to do for the future. Do you think there are votes there to do that, though, in the House? Well, you need all the Republicans and some Democrats. Look, I said in my comments uh, from the bench for the dais, it was the bench for the trial, yeah. it's, this is not a partisan thing. No re future Republican, Democrat, or independent statewide official should be impeached on hearsay and rushed over three or four days 
to send a case to the Senate. In 1917, they sent boxes and boxes and boxes of evidence to the Senate for the trial. We got nothing, basically, zero. Their attitude was, we're like a grand jury. Well, they're not really a grand jury. Grand juries actually have a, a, a relatively high level of, of standard um, in some cases, important cases. But when you're talking about overturning an election, ousting someone from office, you've got to be higher than a typical grand jury on the preponderance of evidence. It should be a high bar. And that's what Travis Clardy said, Representative Clardy, that's what John Smithy said. The House took the lowest bar they could and kicked it over to us. Shouldn't have happened that way. As presiding officer, would yes. you have done anything differently? You know, um, I, I worked my way through it. I, I'll say it that way. So would there be things, little things along the way? Yes. But I think the structure we put together, Jason, I think the Rules Committee wrote a great set of rules based on looking back at 17 and doing things that they didn't do, trying to improve on their errors. Again, the reason I put in my remarks of the future, they improve on what we did. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't go to law school. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I did get a lot of tips from my son, Ryan. Uh, he was a criminal court judge. Right. And he said, Dad, good judges don't talk. They let each side present their case. And when they talk over each other, just say, gentlemen, the court reporters can't record when both of you are talking. He said, that's about all you need to do. And, uh, and, you know, I've, I've been in the legislature now 17 years. I've heard thousands of bills. You know, I'm a good listener. I listen to what people are saying in a debate on the floor or is something germane. So being able to listen to what they were saying, that was the easy part. Uh, uh, I've, I listened to every word. I can pretty much recite every word that was said on the key issues. Uh, did I get some of the objections? Probably, maybe an overrule should have been sustained or vice versa. I might have missed a few, I'm sure. But I had Lana Myers from the Dallas area, uh, who was a criminal court judge and on the Fifth Court of Appeals. She was fabulous, fabulous. Uh, and so when I did have a question, sometimes you saw me turn mm -hmm. to my legal team and her. And other times, she and I had a little signal between us where like, I wasn't sure she could help me along. But on some of the things, you can hear hearsay, you can hear leading a witness, you can hear speculation. Um, so I'm sure I missed a few, but I did the best I could. I heard that you had two sets of closing remarks. Is that right? I wrote, I wrote uh, remarks if he was acquitted and if he was um, convicted. The remarks were pretty much the same, just the opening would have been a little bit different. But I was going to say the same thing because whether he was convicted or acquitted, the House process should have never have happened. It was terrible what they did. And so there were remarks for pretty much the same. Look, when I went into this, and I, th I don't want to speak for the senators, but I think this would be fair to say, they thought a conviction was going to happen because the House said they had all the evidence. Remember, no one had saw the evidence until the trial. No one was on the spot to, under oath, threat of perjury to tell the truth. We assumed at least one of the articles they had a smoking gun. At least one they could prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So I think our members were surprised. Uh, I'm, I'm just speaking for the Republicans. I think that uh, how thin their case was, how they never had a smoking gun, and they didn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But I still didn't know that night, Friday night, um, how, the you know, how the verdict was going to be the next day. I didn't know if there would be one or two articles. Uh, you could look at a lot. Look, the articles were so poorly written. That's another thing. If you look at those articles, I'm going to say it. It looks like someone in high school wrote them. I mean, they, they were poorly written. And remember, the order I gave to the jury, which was correct, is every part of the article had to be true. And some of those articles, there were like three charges in an article. And so if they didn't prove all three charges in one article, beyond a reasonable doubt, then you had to vote to acquit if you followed, right. followed the oath and, and the rules. So the articles were written poorly, left a lot of confusion. Uh, they did not do their job. Were you surprised two Republican senators, Kelly Hancock from North Texas and, and Bob Nichols from East Texas, that, that they voted uh, with Democrats yeah. on a number of these? No. You know, I told the members before we walked out on the first day, I had a meeting back there, and I said, look, two things. This is different than what we do during session. However you vote is your vote. You do what you think is right. You follow your oath, which said follow the law and the evidence. And, what, and no matter how you vote, it does not impact your ability to get a bill passed or, or to be a chairman of a committee. This is totally separate. Do what you think is right. And the second thing um, uh, that I told him was uh, it was important 
for them to decide on their own what was right. And, uh, and I think they did. And so if Robert and Kelly Hancock believed in their opinion, looking at the evidence, that he should have been convicted on this article or that article, I respect their vote. Um, Robert Nichols uh, took, he told me uh, after the trial, he took 170 pages of notes. Hmm. Uh, he's very thorough in what he does. And so I respected everyone, whether they voted to acquit or, or guilt. Have you spoken to Kim Paxton since this? I've not. And no. I'm not going to speak to him about the trial or the evidence. Uh, next time I talk to him, it will be about state business. This, is, this is in the past. We're moving forward. Uh, and I'm not talking to him about either. How about Governor Abbott? Uh, I talked to the governor a, a few hours after the trial uh, because I wanted to know what his thoughts were on the next special session on school choice. And I'll let you ask him what he thought. I don't want to speak for him. Did he ask you about the trial? Uh, I asked him what he thought. We'll You'll have, ask him what he thought. We'll have to ask him. Okay, I don't want to speak for him. When we speak, for, uh, speak to him. I will say a lot of people in the legal profession all over the state, if you ask them, Republican or Democrat, would say, they never proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt and the witnesses weren't very credible. When you have a witness on the stand who says we went to the FBI and we didn't have any evidence, that pretty much destroys the credibility of that witness. What, what, what does that plant in your mind? They went and they came back and tried to fix it and said, well, our experience was our evidence. But, and that's real evidence of your experience, but they went there with no evidence. When you have a witness who was who was uh, discredited when they pulled up his text, which he had erased, but someone else had kept them. It said, we, we have to cook up something on Ken Paxton and Mr. Hammock, a Kamek, and, and Mr. Wynn, three of the, the attorneys. We have to cook up something. Uh, when you have a witness, it says, we have to indict Paxton by, by the spring. Um, when you had a witness, even though a very famous person, who says he was handed a paper in the middle of the night in a back alley, and then under cross, he had to admit that he didn't know that personally and that five or six people told him that and that he couldn't name one person who told him. That impacts the credibility of witnesses. See, people have kind of lost that a little bit. Um, but all those things I just said to you were said in the House investigators. And so that's like they took that for granted. Right. Oh, Paxton's person gave something to someone to Nate Paul in the middle of the night in a back alley. It wasn't true. Right, they took that apart. They, they, yeah, and, but the House assumed it was because it was hearsay, and they didn't cross-examine, and he wasn't under oath. You, you criticized the, the House's process for yes. impeachment here in this interview and, and prior to that. I'm curious, if, if you heard anything during that two weeks, Governor, that, that you think Ken Paxton's behavior might have crossed a line? That's a great question that would be unfair for anyone to really answer. A person was impeached just no different than a criminal trial, a person or a civil trial. A person was found innocent by the jury. For anyone to go back now and say, well, we think this or we think that. I mean, I ha you know, we're hearing this scuttlebutt from the House. Well, if you knew what we knew, well, if you had something else, you should have presented it as evidence. Don't come back now and say, well, we had more. That's just a cop out. But, but did, did Paxton do anything that, that you heard that you, that you thought for an attorney general might have been too much? Uh, obviously, there were things that came up in the trial that I think most people, including myself, would look at and say, you know, wasn't, wasn't very smart. I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to sit here like some other people and say, well, he's going to be convicted later or the FBI should get him. I, I think some of those comments are, are uh, irresponsible. If there's a case later, there's a case later. If he's convicted later on something, he's convicted later. Our job our job was to look at the House case and the evidence and decide could they prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, whatever else was there, whatever smoke that people think there is or whatever's going to happen in the future, the 30 senators said my job is to look at the evidence presented to me in this trial and make a decision beyond a reasonable doubt right now. Whatever happens in the future has nothing to do with, with what they decided. Why didn't Laura Olson testify? So Laura Olson, who was the, the other woman in the, in the trial, for people who don't know, uh, her attorney uh, presented a motion to quash her subpoena to testify. Now, I rule on those, some motions that the senators rule on, some I do. That mm -hmm. was one that would be mine. So 
there was a little discussion up at the, at the bench at the beginning of that day, um, and uh, we said we'd address it later. So we went back, and I took a court reporter with me, so it's, this is all on the record. Uh, I listened to both sides, and the House made their case, and her attorney made her case, and their attorney basically said, look, she's going to take the fifth, she's going to say what her name is, and that is it. Um, and the House said, well, we want to ask her these 20 questions. And then the Senate, I mean, not the Senate, the Paxton side said, well, if you put her up there and ask her 15 or 20 questions and she takes the fifth, that makes our, that could make our client look guilty. And so we don't have a chance to cross-examine. And so I sat there and, and I thought about it. And I thought, I said to the House, I said, look, um, I'm leaning not to have her testify, but I haven't made a decision yet. Um, uh, can you all work this out? And throughout the trial, whenever I brought them up to the bench, I always said, we all work this out, whether it was over exhibits, whether right. it was witnesses, whatever. I said, we all work this out. And immediately, Aaron Epley, who I thought did a really great job for the House, the, uh, the, the prosecutor, right. immediately said, how about if we say she's present but not available? Those were the words of the House manager, not mine. I didn't write that. And I looked at Tony Busby and I looked at Andy Murr, who was standing behind him, and they both shook their head. They're okay with that. But because she would have pleaded the fifth the entire time. She would plead the fifth. Time. Yeah, right. So uh, this is my theory. My theory is the, the Paxton team didn't want her because maybe it, it looked bad. The House wasn't sure how the jury would respond to putting a woman up who's already said, I'm going to plead the fifth on every question. So I think both sides were happy with that outcome. But I want to be very clear. I didn't, I didn't rule on the motion. I didn't stop her from testifying. I asked both sides, can you come to an agreement? And she immediately said, Aaron Epley, her words, court reporter has them. Uh, how about if we say um, she's available but not uh, able to testify? And the reason the House was okay with that was because they didn't want to be criticized for not trying to call her. So both sides felt that was, I think, an iffy witness yeah. that could hurt either case. So they came to that agreement and I want to set the record straight because one of the attorneys on the House side has said, I handcuffed them and stopped that. I had nothing to do with it. That was their decision. Now that there's an acquittal, do you think the House should approve that $3.3 .3 million settlement with taxpayer dollars? Yeah, this, this was another interesting piece of evidence that the House never knew. You know, the, the, uh, one of the articles was he asked for $3.3 .3 million. Well, what did we learn in the evidence? The evidence was Ken Paxton didn't make that proposal. It was the House, the whistleblowers. They, they contacted the Attorney General and said, we want to settle. And the reason they want to settle, I won't go into the detail here, but there was a case before the Supreme Court, and if the Supreme Court ruled in a way that was not good for the whistleblowers, they wouldn't be able to recover any money. So they wanted to get a settlement. So the testimony under oath was they asked for the settlement. And then Paxton said, well, okay, if you want to settle, fine. But, but it was presented as if Paxton wanted the settlement. So he hired a mediator. And the, media, and the mediator met with mm -hmm. both sides, and they came up with $3.3 .3 million. The, if I'm sued as a lieutenant governor for something, I don't pay that suit. I'm an officer of the state. They're suing the office of the lieutenant governor, not me personally. They sued the office of the attorney general, not Ken Paxton personally. So that's the only way we could ever pay out a claim is if the state pays it. Right now, under the rules, any agency that gets sued can pay up to $250,000 without approval. Anything above that needs approval. And so now that the case has been made, that they asked for the settlement, the whistleblowers, uh, and Paxton came to the legislature, it's up, it's up to the legislature. Uh, Do you think that will ever get passed? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. The, the trial once again exposed this rift inside the Republican Party of mm -hmm. Texas, where you have the Paxton supporters on one side versus what they call the rhinos on the other side. How, how bad is the divide? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I always believed that part of this uh, was the House trying to put, first of all, they want to go after Paxton. And, I'm, and again, I'm not talking about the innocent or guilt. I'm just talking about it's obvious they, they created a process that enabled them to go after him very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that flawed process is the reason he got, a, reason he got acquitted. He was, they couldn't find him guilty of anything. And and he, and he may never be charged with anything ever again. This may be the end of this. It's the end of it for the legislature. Um, so he's innocent. In my view, when, when you're put on trial and you're found innocent, you're innocent. I don't like all this talk, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Uh, 
But there's a second part of that. Uh, I believe that the speaker also wanted to put the office of the lieutenant governor in a bad spot. You read all the articles. There was one in the Dallas Morning News. Dan's in a position he can't win. Um, no matter. If he's acquitted, I'll be criticized, uh, hurt me in a general election. If he's found guilty, I'll be hurt in a primary election. I put all that out the window. I'm just going to do what I thought was right, and, I, and I'm 100 percent satisfied that I conducted a fair trial to both sides, and I think both sides will tell you that. And I think most people who watch think I, I conducted a fair trial. And wherever the, whatever happens later happens. Yeah, I did what I thought was right. But I think Dade thought that he could put me in a bad spot. I think the Speaker thought he could put the Senators in a bad spot by making them take tough votes. Because, look, we are the conservative branch in our government. The, the Texas Senate drives all this conservative legislation that the people elected us wanted. The House does not. We fight with them all the time on a lot of this legislation, like school choice. I mean, that's why Greg Abbott said, hey, if you don't pass school choice in this special, then in essence I'm coming after you in the primary. And so the House doesn't, I mean, they don't care much about the Senate. And they don't like the Senate. And um, so I think they were trying to and you guys have weaken to, the Senate. You have to work together. Uh, sure. If, if for the next special session in yeah. October, you guys will have to work together. You know, we had a pretty rocky six months, but we got a lot of really great things done. People are going to have a lot of great amendments. They're going to, uh, constitutional amendments to vote on, biggest tax cut in history. Look, you don't have to get along to do your job. We don't have to be best buddies to do each other's jobs. Um, and so it doesn't bother me. The Texas Senate will always lead on conservative legislation and what the people of Texas ask us to pass. We will do it. And the House needs to follow along a little quicker than they normally do. I mean, I've passed school choice out of this, right. the Senate three times, three different sessions. And we've never even gotten a vote. It's time to vote on that issue. And, and, and this trial, it'll eventually fall in the rearview mirror. But the, uh, the House, you know, I'm sure re relations, I think the relations between the members and maybe the Speaker are more strained than between the House and the Senate right now. So I, that's what I hear. A couple last questions for yes. you, and we'll wrap this up here, Governor. W will you actively campaign against any House Republicans? No. I stay, I stay out of the House races. Um, uh, Unless, uh, there may have been one or two races where I got involved, and it may have been actually where Abbott got involved or, 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 or even the Speaker. It, you know, there may have been like a really bad candidate and we had a good member there. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I'm not going to get involved in those races. Look, these, these members, instead of trying to whip up new conspiracies over there, oh, well, you know, this was all foreseen and, and members worked together. And uh, no, the, the senators, that, that undermines the integrity of every senator. Look. Every Democrat who voted for conviction, uh, the two Republicans who voted for conviction, or all the members who, who voted for acquittal. And remember, every Democrat except one voted for acquittal on one of the issues. I respect their votes. And to question the result of being political is, is, is not fair to those members. I've got 30 senators, people with high integrity, who did the right thing. No one was going to tell them to vote from the outside, inside, or any other senator. They all made their own decisions. And so what the House really needs to do, the Speaker needs to say, look, you know what? Looking back, we didn't do it the right way. John Smithy and Travis Clardy were right. They warned us. And the members, I think, have to go home to their constituents and say, you know what? I made a mistake. Uh, I, should, I should not have voted for impeachment after only having, you know, 20 hours to look at it or whatever. And, uh, and, and I think instead of blaming others, take it on yourselves. It was a flawed process. You voted too fast. You didn't know what you were voting on. And... Uh, or they can go back and blame us, and I don't think that's going to fly in a primary. Just before the trial, made a lot of headlines. You accepted uh, $3 million from right. Defend Texas Liberty. Right. It got the headlines, obviously. Right. Was, was that, the timing of that is what was criticized. Should you yeah. have not accepted that? No. What the media never reports, I actually raised $6 million. And I raised $3 million from... And I normally, you know, we're not allowed to raise money during session. So the last 10 days of June, right. we all rush to raise money um, for the July 15th report, which is out for the next six months. And so I always raise around $4 million, $5 million, $6 million, typical. But this was a pro Paxton group. You had a trial yes. coming up. But, but this is the part that's never reported, so I'm glad you asked me the question. I raised about $6 million, $3 million from the pro Paxton, and about $3 million from the other side. Uh, not in one big check, but most of the people who donated to me. The other three million are all supporters of TLR. So Texans for lawsuit reform. Texans for that that and I don't believe they were in, involved in, in this at all. But they're seen as they're seen as they wanted a trial. 
and they supported other people against Ken Paxton. So anybody supporting TLR would be thought to be, but I know that's not the case, they all were. My point is, I raised $6 million. Um, it got headlines because people wanted to make it a headline from pro-Paxton people, but I also raised almost the same amount of money for people who may not be anti-Paxton, but they weren't out there being pro-Paxton. There are a few exceptions, because some of the people who supported TLR also supported Ken Paxton. Last thing for you. Yeah. The special session on education is yes. finally coming up next month here. Yeah. Rural Republicans in the House have turned down uh, yeah. school vouchers time and time again here. Do you think any votes are going to change come October? I don't know. Uh, we passed out again for the third time. In fact, this year we passed Brandon Creighton, Senator Creighton, who's my education chair, passed a great school choice bill, universal um, uh, school choice. The House watered it down. There, there was a bill they could have passed out that would have been, that, w that I understand the governor didn't support. Uh, they were willing to pass a, a watered down bill. And uh, I don't know what they'll do. Again, I'm going to go back to their members. Strike one, you voted for a, a sports betting bill that if you look at the polling, most of the primary voters didn't support. Dade pushed him to cast that vote, even though he knew we didn't have the votes in the Senate. Number two, uh, they killed school choice, which 82% of Republicans, and that includes rep rep Republicans in rural counties, support. So they're killing a bill their voters want. They passed a bill their voters, most of them didn't want. And then they have the impeachment vote that most of the grassroots didn't want. So if you're a House member and now you have Governor Abbott that says, if you're going to not vote for school choice, I'm going to support your opponent um, in the March primaries. There may uh, be political pressure there. There's going to be a lot of political pressure. How now, some of them may say, I'm just not going to run again. I don't want to put up with all this. Right. I'm out. But anyone who's running again, you know, the secret of the Senate, people say, well, Dan Dan's a, you know, drives a hard bargain in the Senate. All I do is to focus on what people elected me to do on the big issues that Republicans want and many Democrats want and make sure we pass it. That's all I do. Teacher pay raises. Is, Teacher that, pay raises. is that going to happen? I think that would be part of a school choice package. We want it. I, I, look, I, uh, you know, I love the teacher unions. I passed the biggest teacher pay raise in 2019 session. Um, the teacher unions were against it. I passed another pay raise. The teacher union was against it. We had a pay raise this year uh, that, I, that you know I added to the school choice bill at the end and the unions were against it. The union, I want all the teachers out there to understand, any increase you've received in pay and benefits and insurance benefits, the unions have opposed every one of those bills. So the unions get no credit for any of this. Um, the legislature is doing it because the teachers deserve to be paid as professionals and not just as holding a job. My wife was a teacher, my mother-in-law was a teacher, my daughter-in-law was a teacher. I did my own student teaching. I love teachers, they are important. We need to pay them. The unions don't help the situation because they're against everything. Governor, thank you. Yes, sir.